We're going straight live now to the New South Wales Premier, Chris Minns. Chris Minns, thank you for joining me this morning. Thanks, Andrew. Let me start by asking for an update on the floods in New South Wales. There's reports of a, uh, a man has perished. Um, where do things go from here in terms of evacuations and any disaster relief and so forth? What's the latest? Yeah, look, the weather pattern that, that obviously hit Sydney in particular in the last 24 hours has moved down the south coast and off into the Pacific Ocean, which is good news. Unlike the big east coast low of a few years ago that stayed around for several days, it's moved through reasonably quickly. The flood levels peaked yesterday and are starting to recede, particularly in the Nepean Hawkesbury area, which is obviously the the peak uh, area of focus for flood prone communities in Sydney in particular. So they're receding, which is good news. There's been uh, reports of someone who's lost their lives. Police are continuing that investigation. So I don't have anything to say in relation to that, but there's been 960 people that have been evacuated from their homes. And I think this is important too, Andrew. 190 people have been rescued by the SES in flood waters across New South Wales, which is testament to how brave and dedicated our volunteers in the SES actually are. And uh, are you looking at disaster relief already or is it too early? We are. We expect a, a disaster declaration to be declared, a natural disaster declaration to be declared later this morning, which means federal and state funds will flow to local councils as well as communities that have been knocked over, particularly those that have lost uh, their houses or are in, um, are in a bit of peril over the last 48 hours. So that should happen later this morning and uh, it will mean we're in a situation where people can access emergency funds to get back on their feet. All right, I wanted to move now to the housing and immigration crisis, for lack of a better word. You've called on the federal government with other states to fast-track tradies coming here. What do you want the federal government to do? Do you want them, in a way, to target the immigration more at that cohort and, and to otherwise put the brakes on immigration a bit? Look, it's a matter for them, but they've got to make a decision about the mix of inbound immigrants to the country every 12 months. They have to make that determination. We have got major supply constraints when it comes to new home builds in New South Wales and we need help, particularly in construction across the state. So I think it's pretty reasonable for New South Wales to say that there needs to be a priority in relation to that because we need to roll out more housing. And while we can do everything possible in relation to planning and zoning, as well as putting pressure on local councils and my own planning department to get more supply through the system, it only works if in the end a house goes up at the end and we need workers to do that. Is the federal government's housing target unachievable, this 1.2 million new homes in the next five years? In the next year and a bit in New South Wales, our proportion of that national figure will be extremely difficult to meet. And I want to be upfront about that. We're coming from a long way behind. We've got major constraints when it comes to financing from banks as well as labour uh, to build the actual houses. But I think in the long run, it's important to have targets. And, and in the end, everybody needs to know the scale, particularly when it comes to completions for a major city like Sydney, because if we keep missing that target, we've got nothing to aspire to, then it allows everybody, mayors, premiers, senior ministers, leaders of the opposition, to continually get away with saying, well, we're doing everything we can when it comes to housing, but not actually produce the housing needed because to accommodate the, you, the next generation of young Australians. Well, just on that, you must have been concerned when the New South Wales Productivity Commissioner said, if we don't act, we could become a city, city with no grandchildren. It's horrifying. I mean, it's everybody's worst nightmare. It's what happens when you have a decade of undersupply of housing in Sydney as a result of unnecessary over-regulation and red tape, as well as a tendency across all levels of government to say no uh, without thinking about what the consequences are. And the consequences are serious. It means that young people don't get to write their chapter in the next part of Sydney's history or New South Wales's history. And as the Productivity Commissioner said, we could be a city without grandchildren. But are we, just briefly on this, are you confident the federal government can put the brakes on immigration? Because while we have this housing shortage, and you've said yourself, over the next year you can't meet the target, they continue to let more and more people in and they come to Sydney. Yeah, I am. 
I mean, uh, you saw record numbers in the last year. We anticipate that they're dramatically down on that record number for this year and they'll be even lower the year after that. So uh, at the end of the day, they're responsible for it. They're making uh, decisions in relation to immigration policy that means that uh, it should ease the pressure on housing. It's, as you noted, New South Wales takes 37% of inbound migrants across the country. So um, it's obviously going to exacerbate housing costs more here than anywhere else in the country. Let me ask you about this proposal from the federal opposition. Peter Dutton out there spruiking a nuclear future for Australia. As a New South Wales Premier in charge of planning, would you be keen to see a nuclear power plant go on a former coal-fired power station site? Uh, no, I wouldn't. And, you know, I was interested to read the paper this morning that communities in the Hunter were really concerned about it too. And I would be as well if I lived up there. I mean, why should they have to take uh, that as a uh, major piece of infrastructure, a nuclear power plant within their community, having already had to deal with the externalities of coal uh, fields and coal-fired power for the last few decades. The big problem with nuclear energy from New South Wales's point of view is some people say it'll take 20 years to build one. The Coalition says it'll take 10 years. Well, if we split the difference and say it's going to be 15 years, my problem is that coal-fired power stations in New South Wales, the majority of them are due to run out and expire in the next decade. So I've got a problem right now in bringing on new power supply for reliable and cheap energy for New South Wales consumers. And the federal, the federal opposition's timetable doesn't go anywhere near meeting the massive demand on power in the next 10 to 15 years. And so do you think renewables and gas can make up that shortfall? Well, they have to. Uh, they have to. We're putting, along with the private sector, billions of dollars into renewable energy zones. We're making major investments to link those renewable energy zones with the east coast uh, power uh, supply, the, the, the transmission lines that run up and down the east coast of Australia. I mean, there's massive investment taking place. That alongside um, the Energy Security Corporation so that we can have battery technology in place as well is our best bet. And I just, right. I think he's got to be honest and genuine and say, well, if New South Wales' uh, coal-fired power stations are due to close down, mo the majority of them in the next 10 years, What's the, what's the shortest estimate for nuclear energy? It's not inside 10 years, which means that we've got a massive shortfall in the state. You've recently had a dispute with the federal government over GST funds, but given the electoral situation and Anthony Albanese needs WA, I don't think there's much of a hope of that formula changing any time soon. How do you feel about the Feds delivering surpluses and, and New South Wales not getting per capita funds and... Are you hoping for some more money on the side of that deal? Yeah, look, a couple of things in that. I mean, firstly, I think that a long-term reform plan for the GST distribution is in the country's interests, and it's in New South Wales's as well. So, OK, we might not go to a per capita distribution tomorrow, but I think we should start this national debate, and eventually I think it could change, or it should change. I mean, ultimately, if we're going to take 37% of inbound migrants, if we've got the largest population in the country, if we've got massive pressure on our emergency departments and our public schools, we need a fairer distribution. We'd be $3 billion or more than $3 billion better off if they split the GST based on headcount, which means I could triple the size of the New South Wales police force. I mean, we are really getting hosed when it comes to the federal distribution of GST funds. And something's got to give, Andrew, because ultimately we have to eventually say to the people of this state that so much of your money is heading south of the border to Victoria or to one of the richest governments in the entire world in Western Australia. It doesn't seem fair. Well, on the NDIS, there was a story recently the Premier's wanted a delay to the introduction of the legislation the basis of which appeared to be the states hadn't been provided enough in terms of foundational supports and certainly not enough detail. Legislation has since been introduced. Do you have a problem with it going ahead in its current form? Yeah, this, we do, but only in this context. I mean, I think that the growth in cost of the NDIS is serious and I can understand why the Commonwealth Government wants to look at how much it's costing, not today, but tomorrow and certainly in the next 10 years. We want to work with them to make sure that if they're going to make changes to the NDIS, that those that are no longer eligible are 
captured in a net provided by the states. But you'd know, Andrew, we gave all of our disability support services to the Commonwealth Government 10 years ago. So we're starting from scratch. And if the federal government wants the states to start from scratch for what's called foundational support, or if you like, a safety net, they're going to have to give us a bit of time to get it up and running. Uh, I don't think it's unreasonable. Every state, premier and chief ministers made the same request. Just finally, one of your ministerial advisers recommended a journalist called Steve Jackson to work for the police commissioner recently. I'm sure you'd be aware of the issue. Was that a mistake in retrospect? It's led to this Taylor Albeck saga in the courts. Was that, was that a mistake for the minister and, and her office, Yasmin Catley and her office, to get involved in such an appointment for the police commissioner? Oh, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't label it that. I mean, obviously, when it comes to media directors in government departments, there's a conversation that takes place. Uh, people weren't to know that the circumstances relating to an unrelated civil case would uh, release all of this information. And you'd <laughs> understand, Andrew, that when ministers work with uh, uh, directors of government agencies, there's obviously a discussion that takes place. But I want to make it clear, these decisions are for agency heads and um, they've made the decision to not go ahead with that appointment. I think that's the right call. New South Wales Premier Chris Minns, thanks so much for your time.